Coaches and consultants always overlook the importance of one thing in their business, and that is their offer. Everything else in your business can suck. You can be bad at marketing, terrible at sales, but you will still get customers if you can create an irresistible offer that people cannot wait to buy. And you may think that your offer is good enough, but I promise you it can always be made better. And the time you spend doing that is the highest value time that you can spend. Alex Hormozzi already wrote the Bible on offer creation in his book, $100 million offers. A lot of people have read that, but not many have fully implemented it because they get overwhelmed and they can't quite understand exactly what to do. So I decided to make a quick start guide to the $100 million offer process. I went through the whole book and pulled out all the action items and laid them all out in a very clear, easy to understand training so that you can go through your offer and weave in all of these super valuable concepts. And you don't even have to do everything that we cover in this video. If you just do a few of them, I guarantee you, it will be hard for you to not make more money. So without further ado, let's get into the training. So today we're going to learn how to create a coaching or consulting offer so good that people feel stupid saying no. Your offer is the last stop on your customer's journey. It is where you either get a yes or you get a no. We do so much work in this industry, like to get a new set of eyeballs and prove that we're valuable and get them to follow us and get them onto our email list. We create all these sequences to sell our offers. But what about the offer itself? Well, one thing that I've been taught and I've seen in my own experience is that this part, the offer is often neglected in the coaching world a lot. Like coaches will literally just slap something together when it should be getting more attention than anything else. And the good news is there is a framework for this. So there's a guy named Alex Hormozzi. He's a super successful entrepreneur, $100 million net worth. The first book in his series is titled $100 million offers, how to make offers so good people feel stupid saying no. And that is where I'm drawing the inspiration from this training. And so I'm going to borrow a bunch of stories and examples from his book and just teach you what you really need to know. You can still go grab the book and read it. I recommend doing it at some point, but it's not required for you to follow his process because I'm going to break down just what you need to know. And this book, it is the book that the industry has needed for a long time. Alex has said he also is going to write a book on lead gen. He's going to write a book on sales systems, like all the components of succeeding as an entrepreneur. But he decided to start his series with a book about creating offers. Somebody asked him why he decided to do that. And his answer, which is paraphrased, is that it all starts with the offer. If you have a great offer, succeeding is easy. If your offer sucks, no amount of marketing or sales can fix it. So we don't want to just have you blasting content and, and setting up all your funnels and, and going crazy trying to sell something if nobody wants it. Right? I think you've seen in your own experience in life, if there's a, a restaurant that's amazing in your town, they barely have to market it and they have like a two hour wait on a Friday night. But here in Denver, there's like, vape shops on these like rundown streets that are barely struggling to make it and stuff. And it's just because like, there's no market for that, right? It's like, you can probably buy that on Amazon if that's what you want. And so you really do want to put time into crafting the product that you are going to sell. It is somewhat of an in-depth process. I think it might take you a couple of weeks to finish, not necessarily working on it every day, but that's about the time to expect. If you follow the process that I'm going to lay out for you, you will have a coaching or consulting offer that will be a no brainer to your prospects. It will be an offer, like Alex says, so good that people feel stupid saying no. It will also take the rest of the work you do, like marketing sales, launches, your funnels, and put it on steroids. First, we have to cover a couple of basics when it comes to offer creation. This is just a few slides. And then we're going to move on to the advanced stuff to make your offer irresistible. When you put an offer out to the market, it should be targeted at a clear demographic. And a demographic example is like moms or CEOs or dog owners or Marines. 
you want to be able to say, hey, I have a great offer for CEOs. It should be pointed at a specific demographic. Coaches would be another example. Also, your offer should identify where your demographic is today. So examples of that would be, instead of just saying moms, you would say, I have a great offer for new moms. I have a great offer for CEOs of companies with 10 to 50 employees. I have a great offer for dog owners who are struggling with behavior issues. I have a great offer for former Marines looking to reinvent themselves. Can you see how it gets a lot crisper when you not only mention a demographic, but you also point out where they are today? Your offer is likely not going to be for everybody. And lastly, your offer should have what's called a QER. That stands for quantifiable end result. So an example would be get your baby to sleep eight hours every night. Very quantifiable, right? Whether it happened or not. Hire an operations manager to give you back 20 hours per week. Get a well-behaved dog integrated with the family. Start your passion business and grow to 10 grand per month, right? Quantifiable whether or not you got the outcome. That is what I refer to as a QER. These are the basics of putting an offer together. It'll be a little tricky to move forward if you don't know what these are. So I encourage you to pause the video, write down your answers to these three questions, and then we can get on to the advanced stuff. In order to start to dig into the advanced side of things, we have to detour into human psychology for a bit. In the book, Alex talks about how humans are drawn towards things that are fast, require little effort, and have a high likelihood of success. It's those three little bullet points right there that are going to color in most of the rest of this presentation. For example, let's say that you're anxious and you want to relax. Let's compare two options that you have to achieve that goal. You could take a meditation or you could take Xanax. So with Xanax, you take a pill, which requires basically no effort. It works in 15 minutes, which is very short amount of time, and it works every time which is a very high likelihood of success. And you compare that to meditation, which it has to be done daily. It requires a lot of effort and it may or may not even work. Even though we know meditation is the healthier choice for somebody, this is the reason why Xanax is a billion dollar business and meditation companies can't even get close to those numbers. Let's go through one more example. Let's say you want to lose weight and you're comparing two options again. You can either join a gym or you can get a tummy tuck. Now, tummy tuck, it's fast. It probably like takes a few weeks from like surgery to recovery. It requires very little effort. You just go under anesthesia and get it done and then deal with a little bit of pain afterwards. And then it's a high chance of success. Like you're pretty much guaranteed to lose fat, right? The gym, it's quite the opposite. It takes a long time to get the result. It takes a ton of effort and it might not even work, right? You might quit or you might do it wrong or something like that. But you can see why people will pay 25 grand to get their tummy tucked. But 97 bucks for a gym membership feels like too much. It's sort of a crazy world that we live in, but this is reality. The perceived value of the tummy tuck is that much higher because of those three levers. How much time it takes, how much effort it requires, and how likely they are to get the result. I'll be honest, when I first heard these examples from Alex's book, I kind of thought like, I don't know if this is for me. I'm not really in the business of manipulating people or better said, I don't want to sell people things that aren't good for them just to make a profit, right? Because I do believe that doing things the right way in life, it takes hard work. It takes sacrifice. It takes time to get the outcome, right? But as I learned this process more, I realized that I didn't actually have to change the fundamentals of what I was offering. I didn't have to like switch from selling meditation to selling Xanax. I could still stay ethical. I could still sell people what they actually need. But I learned that understanding their psychological drivers would still make it much easier to get them to say yes. So I want you to be assured that we're going to create an offer that aligns with the human drivers that we've gone over a little bit so far. But at the same time, we're not going to cheapen your program or your process in any way. In fact, what I've found is after thinking about your client on this deep level and what really is driving them, you'll find that you'll be able to make your program a whole lot 
better. And if you believe in what you sell, some argue that you should do what it takes to sell it. Even if once people pay you, there's still hard work that they have to do to get the result. When it comes to whether or not to buy something, there's four factors that we weigh in our minds. And I want you to think about this in your own experience when you're making a purchasing decision, you may find that this is true. First of all, we're thinking about the dream outcome. What am I going to get? And is that result meaningful to me? Number two, I'm thinking about the likelihood of me getting that outcome. Do we think we're actually going to succeed? Is this thing that we're going to buy going to work or not? That's why we like read reviews on Amazon before we buy even like a little cheap product. Does this thing work? And then time delay. How long are we going to have to wait to get the results that we are after? And then if four is effort and sacrifice, how much work and sacrifice is this going to take? I want to unpack these four a little bit. And if it feels like you're drinking from the fire hose, don't worry. I'm going to give you a very simple to follow process at the end of this that's going to ensure you're building your offer the right way. So this is just more about wrapping your head around these concepts. You can sit back, crack a beer, and just absorb this stuff. I know when I first learned it, it felt like a lot. First is the dream outcome. That's showing the people why that end result is meaningful. And if you're confused about this one, don't be because you have seen this all the time already. This is what marketers do. They sell you the dream, right? This one is easy to do. So it's hard to compete on if it's all you do, because everybody is talking about the vision. Oh, if you buy my coaching program, you'll have 20 more hours a week that you can spend like with your kids and that kind of stuff. You got to do that as long as it's all true, but still everybody's doing that. So this is a lever that you pull, but it's not the most powerful one, but you still want to check this box. You want to talk about the dream outcome and talk about why it will be meaningful to them. People want to be perceived as beautiful at, at the deepest level. They want to be respected. They want to be perceived as powerful. They want to be loved and they want to increase their status. It's sort of a, a truth that nobody wants to admit, but we all want to increase our status or most people do. Maybe you're spiritually enlightened and you don't care, but most people want a status increase of some kind with whatever they are looking to purchase. And so talking primarily about an increase in the person's status, how achieving the dream outcome is going to increase their status, that is checking the box of making sure you're making that dream outcome meaningful. Just an example that just popped into my mind. I remember a really successful ad for, I think it was a course on how to swing a golf club, or maybe it was a set of golf clubs. The ad didn't talk just about how this type of golf swing is so awesome and it's going to make you drive it 350 yards every time or whatever, but it really talked about the looks on your friend's faces when you whack that ball 400 yards and think about how they will react and, and, and what they're going to say to you. The reason why is that golf ad was playing to the person's status, like your status will go up in the eyes of other people if you buy this golf thing. And so that's a really powerful lever that you can pull in the world of marketing when it comes to your messaging about the outcome of your product. Number two is perceived likelihood of achievement. So do they think they're actually going to succeed? If they don't, there's pretty much no way they're going to buy it, right? They have to think that they're going to get the outcome. People will pay for certainty. They basically ask themselves, okay, how likely do I believe it is that I'm going to achieve the result I'm looking for if I make this purchase? If it's a 10 out of 10, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to make the purchase, right? Especially if like you're offering to make someone more money or something like that. Like give me five grand and I'll make you 50 grand. If they believe for sure that it's going to work, every single person in the world would do what it took to get the five grand. They would literally borrow from their friends or take out a loan if they had that level of certainty that they could do it. Of course, it would also 
to depend on how much time it would take and how much work it would take, which are the other two we're going to talk about after this. Question, how much would you pay to be a plastic surgeon's 10,000th patient where he's got five-star reviews, super successful versus his first patient? The first patient is like their likelihood of getting the result in their mind much lower, a lot less certainty. You'd probably pay a lot to be cut open by the guy who's done it 10,000 times, and you'd probably decide not to get plastic surgery if you had to be someone's first patient, right? When you can increase a prospect's conviction that your offer will actually work for them, it's going to make your offer that much more valuable. Number three is the time delay. So how long do they have to wait? If they, if they buy your coaching or consulting program, you've got a quantifiable end result that's attached to your messaging. How long do they have to wait to achieve that goal, to cross that finish line? You want to shorten the time it takes to get the outcome as much as you realistically can. But sometimes if you need 12 weeks to work with somebody, and you can't shorten it beyond that, then I don't recommend shortening it because you would basically just be lying if you said they could get it shorter than 12 weeks. Beyond that, what you can do after you have defined the shortest time frame and you've, you've structured your program to where it's as streamlined as possible and all that is you can improve the short-term experience as much as you can. This is really important in the coaching world. So you want them to have progress markers to show them they're making progress. You could give them an award as they hit different levels or something or a different percentage. That's why when you take an online course, it'll say, and have like your progress bar at the bottom. It shows you how far along you are. Maybe you get a certificate at the end, but that's just module one of your overall program. But it gives them that sense of, okay, I'm getting small wins along the way. You could introduce them to some new people that are also part of your program. But you want to give people quick wins ASAP. If, if you give someone a great short-term experience, then they're willing to put up with a much longer time delay overall to get the outcome that you're promising. Lastly, number four is effort and sacrifice. So what additional costs or inconveniences do they have to incur to achieve the goal? This is a big one that people are thinking about in an ideal world. A prospect would just want to say yes, and then their dream outcome happens immediately with no effort on their behalf. Like you swipe your credit card and then you lift your shirt up and you have a six pack, right? And we obviously know that's not possible, but we want to almost try to get as close to that as we can while still being honest. And this is why done for you services are almost always way more expensive than a do-it-yourself one because the person doesn't have all the effort and sacrifice. Think about if I told you, I will build your website and all your sales funnels and all your email sequences for you. I'll like set it all up completely on my own. How much would you pay for that? Now think about me saying, hey, I have an online course that I'll sell you that shows you how to build your website, set up your funnels, set up your email sequences. How much would you pay for that? You'd probably pay a lot more for the first option, right? Because effort and sacrifice that you perceive is much, much lower. And this is something that when you're a newer coach, if you don't have confidence sometimes in your skills yet either, you can, instead of just saying, I'm just going to be a consultant, you can do some things for them as a part of joining your program. That's just like an easy way to raise the perceived value because when you do things for them, you are decreasing the effort and the sacrifice. So think about what you can do for your customers and the value of your offer will go way up. Remember the meditation and Xanax thing we talked about? This is it laid out with the different variables that we just went over. So the dream outcome is relaxation and anxiety. And both of those get a one out of one because that's what the person wants and they value that very highly, right? But then from there, it starts to change, right? Perceived likelihood, meditation low, Xanax is high, so Xanax gets a higher score. Time delay, meditation's worse, so it gets a lower score. Effort and sacrifice, same thing. And so in the end, 
meditation gets a 1.5 out of four and Xanax gets a four out of four on this scale with the four things that we've talked about. Dream outcome, perceived likelihood, time delay, effort and sacrifice. Our goal is to increase the first two and decrease the second two. And this is what Alex has referred to as the value equation. We have dream outcome and likelihood on top divided by time delay and effort and sacrifice. Remember, increase the top two, decrease the bottom two. So you're basically trying to increase these as high as you can and get these as close to zero as you can. The higher number you have on top, meaning the dream outcome matters a lot and they have a high likelihood of achievement. And then you're dividing that by very low time delay, very low effort and sacrifice. That equals value. This is the value equation. This is what I wish somebody would have taught me when I got into the coaching space. I didn't know this for years, like what actually drives people. So I didn't know how to pull the levers to get somebody to buy. So your client or your prospective client, they're already thinking about all the problems they might have if they purchase your program. And so what we want to do is get ahead of that and solve those problems in advance. The question is, how do we do all of this? If our goal is, again, to increase the value of the dream and outcome and the likelihood of achievement and decrease the time and effort it's going to take to get it, we have to follow a three-step process that tips that value equation I showed in our favor. So if you're a little confused up to this point, you don't actually know what you're supposed to do, don't worry, I've got you covered. This three-step process ensures that you're going to be checking all the boxes of the stuff that we have covered. The first step is to list out what they must do. So list out everything your prospect must do in order to achieve that dream outcome. For example, if the program is about weight loss, well, what's a client going to have to do usually in a program like that? They're going to have to buy healthy food, cook it, eat it, and they're going to have to exercise, right? Pretty basic stuff. But those four things, they basically create a lot of problems. They're like, oh, I mean, buy healthy food. It doesn't taste good. I got to go to the grocery store. I don't know how to cook. I don't think, I don't want to eat healthy food. Don't like broccoli and exercising. I've tried that before. It didn't work. All these problems immediately pop up in someone's mind when they think about doing these things. What you do is, again, we're getting ahead of that as you list out those problems. So we're going to list out every problem they have or think they have executing each step of the process. So again, one of the things that they have to do, remember on that last list was buy healthy food. What problems might pop up? Well, buying healthy food is hard. It's confusing. I won't like it. It's going to take too much time. It's expensive. I'm not going to be able to cook it forever. My family's needs are going to get in my way. If I travel, I'm not going to know what to get. Or if it's cooking healthy food, well, that's hard and confusing. I've never done it before. It's not going to taste good. I suck at it. It's going to take too much time. It's expensive. It's not worth it. What about the next one? They got to eat healthy food. What problems do they have? One is that you list them out. And then they got to exercise regularly. What problems are they going to have with that, right? It'd be pretty easy to think of what those problems might be. Just what are the general objections? Like I, me personally, I hate running. So if a program is going to tell me to run, I'm immediately going to be like, nope, tried that before. It's boring. I don't like it. I can't stick with it. But I wouldn't buy a program that was going to teach me running unless they helped me get past these problems that immediately are popping up in my brain. That's where we're going with this. Okay. So in summary, step one, we defined the, what they got to do, like eat healthy food, exercise regularly. Step two is we listed out all the problems that they think they're going to have doing those things. And now we're on to step three out of three, which is where we turn those problems into solutions. And we do that using how-to statements. This kind of reminds me of like those motivational person development guys that are just like, you can fix any problem and all you got to do is just be positive and turn it around, right? That's kind of what we're doing here. We're like taking a problem that buying healthy food is hard, confusing. I won't like it. I'll suck at it. And we're turning it into a solution. That's a how-to statement. So it'd be how to make buying healthy food easy and enjoyable so that anyone can do it, especially busy moms, right? So we've flipped the problem 
into a solution. Or if the problem is that buying healthy food takes too much time, we're going to flip that how to buy healthy food quickly. So it doesn't take too much time. You might ultimately morph that into how to have healthy food delivered to your doorstep using my XYZ system or whatever. Buying healthy food is expensive. Flip that into a solution, how to buy healthy food for less than your current grocery bill. And then we just keep going down the list. So we're cooking healthy food, the same problems, how anyone can enjoy cooking healthy meals easily, or if it'll take too much time, how to cook healthy meals in under five minutes. And we go on and on. Cooking healthy food is unsustainable. How to make healthy eating last forever. Can you see what we're doing is we're, we're seeing where we have to go with the components of the offer that we're going to put together. If we want people to actually buy it because they actually don't have any more objections, right? Because like we've tackled everything. We've dealt with every problem that's popping up in their brains. Eating healthy food. The problem is I won't like it. Well, how to eat delicious, healthy food without following complicated systems. Healthy food's expensive. How eating healthy is actually cheaper than unhealthy food. Eating healthy food is unsustainable. How to make healthy eating last forever. Some of these are somewhat repeated. I apologize. Exercising regularly. Remember, it's hard, it's confusing. I like it. I suck at it. How to enjoy exercise by following this simple system. Where are we going with all of this? So once you go through that process, you define what people have to do. You list out the problems that they're going to have doing it. And then you lastly turn those problems into solutions using how-to statements. You're going to have a big list. It might look something like this. Okay. So this is the goal. When you get to this step, you've really gotten somewhere when it comes to creating your offer. And so you look at a big solutions list for your program. And then when you have your solutions list, it is what your actual offer will emerge from. The actual components of your program will be carved out of your solutions list. So you're not just going to use this exact copy how to, because this is very basic. Enjoy exercise by following a simple system, right? But you're actually going to give these names. You're going to you create a framework, something that's, that's uniquely yours, potentially for every thing that you include in your program. But this is like the raw material that you mold into that. Have you ever seen one of these before? It's like a offer stack. I took this from Russell Brunson. When you're at the end of a webinar and they're doing the stack and here's all the stuff you're going to get. Well, your solutions list becomes your offer stack, basically. What do you think about like when Russell put this offer together? He was probably like, okay, what problems do they think they're going to have if I sell them a year of click funnels? Well, they don't know how to use it. I don't know how to even like philosophically, I don't understand funnels. Okay. Six week funnel hack masterclass that answers that problem. Well, I like am not going to get, how do I get traffic to my funnels? I could have it set up there. But what if nobody shows up? Instant traffic hacks, inception secrets. So Seinfeld, that is, has to do with your email sequences to your list, right? He probably put that in there because people were like, well, what about the emails that I send people? That's a big part of like setting up funnels. And I don't know what to say in the emails to get people back into my funnels or to get them to buy my stuff. When people are putting an offer together, if you've ever been on a webinar and you've been like, man, this person's like speaking directly to me. Like they, they've literally answered every objection. It's like Alex says in his book subtitle, they, they're making an offer so good that I would feel stupid to say no to this. Well, it's because they've thought through it. It's because they've thought through everything that you could possibly object to. And they've come up with a solution for that ahead of time. Again, you have to do this in an authentic way. You can't just like throw something together. If you literally can't cook healthy meals in under five minutes or whatever, then you'd have to leave that out or whatever. But if you can figure out how to do that and you can find a way to teach it in your program, your program just got that much better because you answered every problem. And Alex says in his book that if there's 47 problems in a prospect's mind when it comes to buying your thing, 
if you only answer 46 of them, they still won't buy or, or they might, but some people won't if there's one thing left untouched. And so he said, your goal is to actually solve every single problem for your customer in the components of your offer. So when you've solved every problem, your potential clients think they will have in advance, then you will have a program that increases the likelihood of achievement, like we talked about, decreases the amount of time it will take, and it decreases the amount of effort and sacrifice required. Because when you start to list out the problems that everyone's going to have, like, oh, problems with cooking healthy food, problems with eating healthy food, problems with this, they're always tied back to these. They're always tied back to, ah, it's going to be hard. Ah, it's going to take time. Ah, it's not going to work. When you solve the problems, you do this, you, you increase the likelihood of achievement, you decrease the other two. And so you tip that value equation in your favor. Also, I believe that creating offers in this way is just the right thing to do. Even though that might sound odd after the meditation Xanax analogies, but the truth is once you go through the process, you're going to realize, man, I've really thought through what my clients are going to need to have the highest chances of success here. And I've just made my program a lot better. Actually, I've added a bunch of stuff to it that I didn't have before. And so I encourage you to have that sort of faith as you go through it, that maybe this is the high road. Maybe this is actually the best way to do it. First, complete the offer basics. Remember that's demographic where their starting point is today and what the quantifiable end result is. And then complete your solutions list like we sh showed on the previous slide. After that, you can move on to part two of this training. In part two, just to give you a little bit of a foreshadow, that is where we will actually give your solutions names, right? So we won't just say how to cook healthy food in five minutes. It'll have a name or a system or a framework or a blueprint or something like that. We will create your offer stack out of those solution names like Russell had on that previous slide for his offer. We will add a guarantee to your offer, which is another way to remove risk from purchasing your offer. It's very important to have a guarantee. We will add bonuses and these bonuses can further add to all those psychological factors. We will add scarcity, which is really important, giving people some kind of a deadline to act now. We'll give your offer a container word like your fast track or your system or your blueprint or your intensive or your mastermind, and we will choose your price. And then you will have an offer that you are ready to sell, but not just something you can sell, but something that is going to be way more likely to succeed than if you just slapped something together and you didn't follow this process that has worked to generate hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars from Alex and just all the other people that have used this. So I hope you've enjoyed this training and I will see you in part two. So this is part two of the 100 million offer training, how to make offers so good people feel stupid saying no. And this part is called the seven steps to making your offer and no brainer. In this section, we're going to do something with all that work that we've put together. We're going to actually decide what deliverables to include in our offer. If we have a solution statement like how anyone can enjoy cooking healthy meals easily, we're going to answer the question of like, how are we actually going to help them enjoy cooking healthy meals easily? Is that going to be a training video, a live workshop, one-on-one -on -one coaching, a checklist, a template? or something else. Then once we have our deliverables nailed, we will enhance the offer with guarantees, scarcity, urgency, and naming. There's seven steps in today's training. So I have a bit of a disclaimer for you guys. This is deep, powerful stuff. It's taken me a while to understand all this and I'm still working on it, honestly. So you may feel overwhelmed already. Just remember that creating great offers is a practice. It's not something you nail perfectly on the first try. But with this framework, what you do come up with on your first try will be a thousand times better than what you might otherwise have created because you have the framework for what 
works the best right now. So don't worry if you don't understand everything or don't worry about if you're doing it perfectly or not today. With that disclaimer, let's move on to a really cool concept that I learned from the book. It's called the sales to fulfillment continuum. It basically states this, anything that's hard for you to fulfill on is going to be easy to sell and vice versa. Anything that's easy for you to fulfill is going to be hard to sell. So if you do everything for someone, like if I told you, I will create your content for you, I will fly to your house, film you, I will build your funnels, I will get on calls and close your clients for you. It would be easy for you to justify paying me. But if you do nothing for somebody, like if I say, here's access to an online course, buy that from me, it's going to be harder for me to sell that but much easier for me to fulfill it. Here's the link to the course. You're either going to have to pick something that's easy to sell, but it's hard for you to fulfill when you get a customer or hard for you to sell, but easy to fulfill or somewhere in the middle, but you're always sort of battling it being, there's going to be a downside to whichever angle you choose. So how do you think about where you're going to land on this spectrum? So when it comes to that, Alex Hormozzi's mantra is, to create flow, monetize flow, and then add friction. This means to generate demand first, get people to say yes. What he means is if you're new and you need to make cash, then choose an offer that's easy to sell, but hard to fulfill. So you're on the right side of that picture. And then once you have people saying yes, then and only then do you add friction to your offer, to your marketing, i.e. you're trying to offer less, for the same price. So then you would decrease what you offer. You would start to make fulfillment easier as you get customers cash, but then you're going to ramp up your challenge when it comes to making sales. And this philosophy of thinking about this, it's just driven by practicality. Because if you can't get demand flowing in, then you have no idea whether what you have is even good. You have, you're just like on a lonely island. You have no customers, nobody to talk to, nobody to like take through your program. Your business also has no cash flow. And so Alex says, I would rather do more for every customer and have cash flow coming in than optimize my business, but have zero cash flow coming in after and zero idea about what I need to adjust to better serve my customers. Create cash flow by over delivering like crazy at first with your offer. Then use the cash flow to fix your operations and make your business more efficient. Gradually make fulfillment more automated and streamlined. And you don't actually have to change what you're offering as you shift from one side of that continuum to the other. You'll probably just create systems that give you scale, but give the customer the same amount of value and it costs you less time and resource. So when I learned about this, sales to fulfillment continuum it and how to position myself on it that helped me a ton it also kind of made me realize okay i can i have the ability to get customers if i want yeah i might have to like sell my soul to the devil basically i might have to just offer so much that it's going to be really hard for me to fulfill but that's how i can get things going in the beginning and after that, I can gradually inch myself out of the fulfillment. And so I hope that helps you as well. And with that thinking in mind, I want to go ahead and decide on what you will offer in terms of your deliverables. So there's a few considerations to think about before we get into what you're actually going to do. One of them is like, what level of personal attention do you want to provide your clients? Do you want to do one-to-one, -one, small group, or one-to-many? What level of effort is expected from them? <laughs> is it going to be a do-it-themselves, do-it-with-them, or done-for-them type of offer? If you're doing something live, what environment or medium do you want to deliver it in? Like you could do in-person, Zoom calls, email support, or if you're going to do recordings, how do you want them to consume that, audio, video, or written? And how quickly do you want to reply? How much do you want to be available? What days, what hours, what format, email, messenger, Voxer, Slack. And as a side note, this is something that Alex points out in the book that I think is powerful. You know, he says, if there's one type of delivery vehicle to focus on, it's creating high value one to many solutions. 
those are the ones that typically have the biggest discrepancy between cost and value. And that's also something that you can scale. And so you can start out coaching one-on-one, but if you want to really grow, then like high value one-to-many type solution is where everyone ultimately ends up. So jot down some notes around those questions just to get a rough idea of what types of deliverables you might want to make available for your clients or the way that you're going to deliver them. That's going to help you choose delivery vehicles that are aligned with what you want to offer. So we've now arrived at step one. There's Remember, there's seven steps in today's training. Some of these are going to be pretty quick. Some of these are going to be a little longer, but this is the execution part of today's training. And step one is to create those solution delivery vehicles. So remember the problem list that we came up with and the solutions that are phrased as those how-to statements? You remember that? Well, it's time to start brainstorming about everything you could possibly do to solve each problem. And you do want to think about anything you could possibly do. Like for the purpose of creativity, you can get kind of wild when you make this list. Like, well, I'd be outside their front door at 6 a.m. every morning with their smoothie in hand, ready to drive them to the gym and work out with them. I think you guys know where that would be on the sales to fulfillment continuum, right? But you start with this type of divergent thinking, I believe it's what it's called. And then you kind of whittle it down to what's realistic, but don't limit yourself. Start by thinking crazy. Walt Disney was famous for having his employees do crazy creativity exercises. Like they would think about how they could build a ladder to the moon or something like that to really get the juices flowing in their brains before they came up with the next, you know, Mickey Mouse skit or whatever, and it helped them not limit possibilities in their mind. So I want you to really take that to heart when you're coming up with your first draft of options of things you could do to solve your customer's problems. Like, well, I would fly to meet them in person at the coffee shop every single week for an accountability meeting. Think of all the things that might enhance the value of your offer so much that they would basically be stupid to say no to it. What could you add in your offer where somebody would immediately say, all that, seriously? Yeah, I'm in. And doing this exercise, guys, it's going to make your job of selling so much easier. And you only need to do this one time. I know this exercise might be a bit intimidating if you've never done it before. But you only need to do this like high level creative thinking one time for a product that might last you for years. So this is high value, high leverage work. You ultimately get paid for thinking. So go ahead and list out all of your possibilities now. So for example, if we had the problem, well, buying healthy food is hard. And then your how-to solution statement was how to buy healthy food from the comfort of your couch in five minutes per day. If you were going to deliver that result in a one-to-one environment, you might actually go to the grocery store with the person and teach them how to shop, make them personalize grocery lists, do full service shopping where you buy the food for them, do text support or phone call support while shopping. If it was a group solution, it might be where you meet a group of people and take them shopping together. Again, you could make personalized grocery lists for a group. You could buy all their food for them and deliver it to them as well. Or if you were thinking about a one-to-many solution, it could be a live grocery tour that was virtual, a live stream of me going through the grocery store, a recorded tour, a grocery calculator, predetermined lists, a buddy system, pre-made Instacart grocery carts where you just one-click, add everything to your cart, check out. It's like super streamlined. So I want you to pause the video and do this for all of your perceived problems that your clients encounter before, after, and during their experience with your service and products. And you're going to have a monster list by the end of this. Okay. So I remember when I first did this and even the most recent time I did it, when I got to this step, I was like, ah, this is going to be a lot of work. I'm kind of intimidated by this part. It's not as much as you might think. And once you have your monster list, a lot of it's repetitive. You get to whittle it down. A lot of the delivery vehicles you create are going to be overlapping. Like you might have, I'm going to make an online training video as the solution for like 18 of the problems that you write down. And that can get combined and just do a few courses or trainings later. I want to tell an anecdote that's from the book from Alex. 
because he really stresses this idea that you need to solve every perceived problem that your customer has. And so in the book, he tells a story about when he used to sell weight loss programs. And he always insisted that folks prepared all their food at home. He just found it too difficult to help clients lose weight because every time they ate out, they always screwed up, blew their diet. And he didn't want to solve that problem. So he just insisted they do it his way or not at all. He wasn't going to take them as a customer. And as a result, he lost a lot of sales to this objection. And one month he really needed to make some sales to pay rent. And his next sale walked in the door and it was a business executive looking to lose weight. She told him the program wouldn't work for her because she went out to eat for lunch every day. Normally he would have lost that sale because he was a stickler for making people not eat out, but he really needed the money. He didn't want to lose the sale because of this thing anymore. So he conceded. He says, all right, what if I make you an eating out guide for when you go to restaurants so you can eat out a hundred percent of the time and still hit your goal? How does that sound? And then she agreed and he closed the sale and he took the time to make an eating out guide for her. Over time, he continued to solve obstacles with templates and trainings until there weren't any more of those one things that were left to prevent him from getting the sale. And that's a lesson that is really, really powerful. If you think about it, that's your job in this industry is to solve the problems for the customers and to continue to get better and to continue to add to your offer all the time. So find a way to solve every problem a prospect presents. When you do that, you make an offer that like his subtitle in his book said, is so good, people feel stupid saying no. That was step one. You're coming up with your actual deliverables and what you're going to offer. And once you have those, you have that monster list. Remember, it's time to trim and stack. So you're going to have a gigantic list. And then the way that you trim it down is you look at the cost of providing these solutions to your business. How much time and money is it going to take? And you remove the ones that are high cost and low value first and then remove the low cost and low value items. And again, this part was a little confusing to me when I first did it. Don't worry if it is to you. If you're not sure what's high value, just ask yourself what things will your customer find financially valuable, cause them to believe they will be likely to succeed, make them feel like they can do it with a lot less effort and sacrifice, help them accomplish their goals, see the result they want with far less time investment and you will know what to keep. There's going to be some stuff on your list that's just not that punchy. Just, ah, it's like not super great. And you want to trim it down. You want to get this stuff out of there. And what should remain are offer items that are low cost, high value, and high cost, high value. And then at the end of this training, we're going to give those things names and package it together nicely, put a bow on it. Now that you've listed out your delivery vehicles. You've trimmed them down and somewhat organized them. So it's not just a big sloppy, messy list. Next, we want to look at some marketing fundamentals that really get people to act. And the first one is scarcity. So there's three types of scarcity, like a limited supply of seats or slots, a limited supply of bonuses, or something never being available Again, you've seen all this too in the coaching world, right? I'm only accepting two clients per week. I'm only accepting 10 clients in this cohort. You won't see this price ever again. These bonuses go away at midnight, right? You've seen this so many times. There's a reason why I do this because you really have to, to get people to act. Another pro tip is when it comes to one-on-one, -on -one, try to sell a very limited supply of one-on-one -on -one access in your offers. One-on-one -on -one is like your ace in the hole. Your time is so valuable, right? Because you know when you do exchange your time with a client, you are trading other high-level work you could be doing to grow your business. So I often you know, reserve one-on-one -on -one time for if someone's paying my high ticket price, I'll do it. But Often when launching a new program, I'll say something like, if you enroll by Sunday, you get one two-hour jumpstart call with me, and that tends to work well, but it also limits the amount of one-on-one -on -one time to just that one call. All right, so if you have added some scarcity to your offer, like these bonuses are going away, you won't see this kind of thing again, the next thing you want to do is add urgency. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. One of them is called cohort-based rolling urgency. Like if you start clients every week, you could say, if you sign up today, I can get you in with our next group that kicks off Monday. 
Otherwise, you're going to have to wait until our next kickoff date. Or seasonal urgency, this is very common with the launch models that internet businesses use. They actually have the sign-up date countdown you know, on their website, but you just want to make sure that it is real. You will see your conversions go through the roof when you add a deadline to your offers because deadlines are what create urgency. I remember doing one of my first launches for a real estate program. The offer closed on Sunday at midnight. And I remember like five or six people buying this thing for $2,500 that Sunday night. I was like, I made like 12 grand or something in the final hours. And it's crazy to think about like people waited that long, you know, it's like there's Sunday, Sunday, they're supposed to be like hanging out with their families and stuff, but they were like on the internet, putting their credit card in to join my program because the deal was closing down. But I didn't think that type of stuff really worked. I was just following the launch model I was taught. Yeah, it's definitely a real thing. It works. So that's why deadlines are powerful. And you've seen all this, right? You've seen like our new year promotion ends January 30th. Valentine's lover promo, sexy by spring, fools in love, April. I guess if you were selling like a relationship product, these are examples. I pulled these out of the book, but you can see how you could take the same offer that you're creating on this training and then keep relaunching it with promotions based upon different like seasonal landmarks throughout the year. Pricing or bonus-based urgency is cool because you can create urgency using your actual offer or a promotion or pricing structure that they can miss out on. And that allows businesses that sell clients year-round to still use urgency. For example, like just this week, we're allowing people to join on a three payment plan. Or for those who attended the webinar on Friday, if you join by Sunday, you get the two bonus trainings absolutely free. So if you taught like a webinar every week, you could essentially swap out the bonuses each week that people get so that it is real. Like these bonuses are going away, but also continue to sell the offer each week. So you could just change something about it. This week, we've got promo pricing. This week, we've got two free online courses included. This week, if you get in, we've got a guest teacher coming on who normally charges $500 an hour. And you're going to be able to watch him in a small group and do Q and A. Like you can always have something that creates the urgency for them to sign up. Now, another thing is what they would call exploding opportunity. So sometimes you will be exposing the prospect to an arbitrage opportunity. So the opportunity itself will be your leverage because it has a ticking time clock. Every time, you know, or every second that someone delays, they miss out on a disproportionate gains. Like if someone's in the stocks or crypto market, it would be easy to say, hey, there's this new crypto stock that you've got to get in now. And I'll teach you how to do it. Click this button to to sign up for my course or whatever. And so the crypto opportunity itself is the source of the urgency. If I was still coaching real estate, I'd probably be saying, hey, there's never been a better time to start investing in real estate. The market is finally cooling off. If you're going to get in the game, this is the best time to get started and learn how to do this now. This is one of my mentors, Brendan Burchard. He said in a recent training just a few weeks ago on a live summit, he goes, if you don't have a deadline, you're going to lose out on 80% of your sales. Even I can't sell anything without a deadline these days. People are too busy and too distracted. So it is really important that you have a deadline or you create some type of urgency in your offer. All right, four down, three to go, guys. So number five is about bonuses. And this one is really cool, possibly the most powerful of all of them. The logic with bonuses is that a single offer is less valuable than the same offer broken into its component parts and stacked as bonuses. And you guys have seen this before, all the webinars and things. It's like, but wait, there's more. You get this and this and this and this and this, right? It's the same offer, but you're breaking it down and presenting it differently. And it's perceived as a lot higher. Basically, if people don't know that your current service provides all those things, it's better to break them out as bonuses and deliver them that way. Let's talk about infomercials for a second, because they are the king of this. You know how every infomercial always continues on with, but wait, there's more? Well, they would sell like one 
knife for $38.95, then give you 37 other knives, sharpeners, pans, and guarantees to beat the prospect into submission. Basically, what they do is they establish the price by saying, this knife is $38.95, and you're like, eh, I don't know, it seems a little expensive. But then they expand upon what you get until you feel it's such a good deal, it would be stupid to pass it up. So the reason why this works is you're basically increasing the prospect's price to value discrepancy. And you're doing that by increasing the value instead of cutting the price. So we anchor the price to that core offer. The knife is $39. And then with each increasingly valuable bonus, that discrepancy grows wider and wider. And then eventually it's too big to bear and we snap the rubber band in their mind that's holding their wallet in their pocket and they have to pay us. So remember in step one, how we came up with all the deliverables you could provide to your clients. Like, oh, I could have the grocery calculator. I could have the Instacart shopping list, one click buy system and all that stuff. Well, most of that stuff is going to end up being presented as a bonus to whatever your core offer or main thing is. So a lot of those things, you're, you're just basically coming up with your bonuses. Now there's some things to remember about bonuses in your offer. One is that you should always offer them. Two is that they should have a special name that has a benefit in the title. Three, there should be tools and checklists. Those are better than just more and more trainings. That's because if you're going to give them a checklist or a tool or access to a piece of software, they think that's going to be less effort for me and less time for me since that perception of less effort, less time, less time exists with tools and checklists to them, the value of those is higher. And then each bonus should address a specific concern or obstacle in the prospect's mind about why they can't or won't be successful. Remember, in the beginning, when we talked about all the problems they think they're going to face when they try to get the outcome, but your bonus is basically the objection buster to that thing. Like you remember when I showed you Russell Brunson's slide, and he had like a funnel hacks masterclass. That was like his core offer. And then his prospects are like, well, how do I get traffic to my funnel? Well, one of his bonuses was instant traffic hacks, right? And that bonus basically busted the objection that he knew they were going to have, which is like, I can't get traffic to my funnel. Also, remember that the value of bonuses should eclipse the value of the core offer. This is really interesting. I'm going to give you an example of this in a second. And then also psychologically, as you continue to add offers, it continues to expand the price to value discrepancy, like with the infomercial. And it also subconsciously communicates that the core offer must be valuable because if these are just the, then the main thing has to be way more valuable than just the bonuses, right? Well, the truth is, no, it doesn't have to be, but you can use this psychological bias to make your offer seem wildly compelling. When you're describing a bonus, the way you do that is you tell your prospect how it relates to their issue, what it is, how you discovered it, what you had to do to create it so they realize how much equity you sweat equity you put into it, how it will specifically improve their lives or make their experience faster, easier, or there will be less effort or sacrifice required from them. You remember the value equation from part one. Also, when describing a bonus, provide some proof, like a stat or a past client or a personal experience to prove that it's valuable and paint a vivid mental image of what their life will be like, assuming they have already used it and are experiencing the benefits. You guys see how powerful this can be when you stack all this on top of each other. Also, always ascribe a, pi a price tag to them and justify it. Like when Russell Brunson says, you know, instant traffic hacks has easily has a $997 value, but you're getting that for free. And the reason why it's 997 is because if you just get one client, you'll make back five times that or whatever. So you're justifying it, you're giving it a price tag. And then you're saying, but hey, it's just a free bonus in this offer. Also, you can further enhance the value of your bonuses by adding scarcity and urgency to the bonuses themselves, which takes this technique and puts it on steroids. For example, only people who sign up for XYZ program will have access to my bonus one, two, three. They're never for sale or available anywhere else other than through this program. Example, I have three tickets left for my 5K virtual event. If you buy this program, you can get one of the last three tickets as a bonus. So these are bonuses. 
They're valuable on their own. Oh, I'm getting a ticket to a virtual event for five grand, but then also there's only three tickets left. So now there's scarcity and a bonus, and that's really powerful. Or a bonus with urgency would be like, if you buy today, I will add in this bonus that normally costs $1,000 for free. Advanced level bonuses, other people's products and services. I think this one is super cool. So you can think about what other businesses would also serve your ideal client and how can you get their services and products as a part of your offer to be included in your bonuses. And then the reason why they do that, it's free marketing for them. They get exposed to your clients. It's a win-win. And the cool thing is if you secure enough of these relationships, you can literally justify your entire price in the savings and additional true to Bryce bonuses. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say you owned a pain clinic. You could get a massage therapist to offer one to two free massages to your clients, $200 value. Get a chiropractor to give your clients two free adjustments, $100 value. Get a low inflammation food company to give you discounts, $50 in savings. Negotiate discounts for braces and orthotics. $150 in savings, or get a local health club to give your clients a, a training session for free and a free month membership, $100 value. So you're sending clients to these businesses and those clients might stick. They might end up staying at the health club or going to continue to see the masseuse or their chiropractor or whatever. And so it's valuable for them. If you add up like all the savings that we've listed out here, let's say your offer was 400 bucks. Well, the value of those free bonuses alone was five or $600, right? So it's more than the 400. So your prospects would scratch their head and basically say, so wait, your program has $400 and I'm going to save 550 when I join. So I'm basically getting paid to sign up for your program. And then if that weren't awesome enough, you can even negotiate commissions for yourself from the companies you partner with. And you can also use affiliate links to generate revenue streams for your business as well. Like for example, I, I make money each month from people that signed up from, for prop stream. It's like a real estate analyzing there or through Kajabi for, you know, coaches building their websites. I've made thousands of dollars from each of these companies just by promoting them to my clients. So you can think about creating additional revenue streams from the clients that you generate by partnering with other companies. So in summary, you want to employ bonuses because they expand the price to value discrepancy, get people to purchase who otherwise wouldn't. They massively increase the prospect's perception of the value of your offer. Also, remember that checklists, tools, swipe files, scripts, templates, anything else that would take a lot of time and effort to create on their own but it's easy to use once created, which you can invest in one time that clearly costs you time or money to create, but it can be given away endless amount of times after that. Those are perfect fits for your bonus. Also make it a habit to record every workshop, webinar, event, interview, and use those as additional bonuses as needed. And you're, again, you're using those to crush perceived obstacles that people will have. I remember I signed up for a coaching program one time. They were like, you're going to get recordings to every one of our private 25K per year mastermind meetings, like hours and hours of, of content. I probably watched like 2% of it. But to me, I had a perception that that was really valuable and that got me over the line to pay them a bunch of money. Also, the longer you're in business, the longer you're doing this, the more assets you're going to acquire and build, the more relationships you're going to have. And the better you can make your offer. So everything gets easier over time. All right. Step six is all about adding a guarantee. So the big elephant in the room is that the greatest objection for any product or service being sold is risk. Risk that it doesn't do what it's supposed to do for them. Therefore, reversing risk is an immediate way to make an offer more attractive. And the way to reverse risk is through guarantees. You think about how many times you bought something because your risk was reversed through a guarantee. Like I bought several mattresses in the last five years or so, and I've even sent a couple of them back online because they had a 90 day sleep trial. They eliminated the risk in my head of what if I don't like it? There's no way I would have ordered a mattress online without ever having laid on it. If 
I didn't have the option to send it back. Also, you must always hit your guarantee hard. Say it boldly and give the reason why. And what makes a guarantee have power is a conditional statement. Like if you do not get X result in Y time period, we will Z. To give a guarantee teeth, you have to decide what you'll do if they don't get the result. So without the or what portion of the guarantee, it sounds weak and diluted. Like a bad example will be, we will get you 20 clients guaranteed. A better example would be, you will get 20 clients in your first 30 days, or we will give you your money back plus the advertising dollars you spent with us. Unconditional guarantees are basically like a trial where they pay first, then they see if they like it. This gets a lot more people to buy, but it also increases refunds the most. This is not something you need to worry about reading right now, but this is one of the guarantees that worked the best for this guy named Jason Fladelian who's called the $100 million webinar man for how much he sold of his coaching programs on webinars. And this is like not a slide he put on his webinar, but this is like the script that he read. And so I put this on here so that when you are putting your guarantees together, you can come to this, pause the video and kind of create your version of this. But it's really well spoken, real well put, and it will help you make a really good unconditional guarantee for your coaching program if that's what you want to do. Service guarantees, basically it's like, if you've ever seen, I'll keep working with you for free until X outcome is achieved. This is actually Alex's favorite guarantee and mine as well. I've used this successfully in multiple offers. Like I'll keep working with you until you buy your first rental property. I'll keep working with you until you get your next three coaching clients. I'll keep working with you until your book is live on Amazon. I've had these conditional service guarantees built into a lot of my offers. And it's kind of hard for people to say no, because it essentially guarantees they will achieve their goal, but it eliminates the element of time. So you're never at risk of losing the money. You're just at risk of having to work with them forever. The guarantee is around the outcome. And I recommend making this guarantee conditional on them doing key actions linked with success. This is best for you and them. It holds you both accountable. You have to set up your webpage. You have to attend the calls. You have to do what I say. You have to show up to your workouts or whatever. Whatever you know they're going to have to do, make sure that's required of them for you to continue working with them for free. Don't just do it if they're not doing their part. If you just did want to have the risk of working with someone forever, you could change it to, I'll work with you for 90 more days at no charge if you don't get the outcome that I told you you would. There's also such thing as anti-guarantees. And those are basically, if you've ever heard what people say, which I know you have, that all sales are final. That's what an anti-guarantee is. And you want to own that position. You want to come up with a reason why all sales are final. So you basically want to show massive exposure or vulnerability on your part where the consumer would immediately understand and say, yeah, that makes sense. Anti-guarantees work very well with high ticket products and services that require a lot of work, customization. Here's how you might say it. If you're the type of person who needs a guarantee, then you're not the type of person we want to work with. We want motivated self-starters who can follow instructions or not looking for a way out before they even begin. If you're not serious, don't buy it. But if you are, boy, you're going to make a killing. So if taking on a client costs your business a lot of money, then this boldly states, you can't get your money back. And you tell them because, hey, look, you're going to have access to our expensive team of web developers for 40 hours per week, right? When you sign up, this costs us a lot of money. And so that's why we don't offer refunds. So instead of being wishy-washy and kind of just not mentioning anything about a guarantee, Alex stresses in its book, his book that it's very important that you like go hard on your guarantee, one direction or the other, either unconditional or it's conditional based upon these terms, or there is no guarantee. And here is why, because my product is badass. So it's better to lean into the fact that what you do works so well, you must make all sales final. Lastly, guarantees are enhancers, right? They can enhance the magnetism or the attraction of your offer, but they cannot make your business. If your guarantee is used to cover up a poor sales team or a poor product, it's just going to backfire into lots of refunds and bad reviews. Last little pro tip, if you're going to give a guarantee, spice it up. Instead of just using some other vanilla word like satisfaction, describe it more strongly. So don't just say 30-day money-back satisfaction guarantee. 
say, in 30 days, if you wouldn't jump into shark infested waters to get our product back, we will return every dollar you paid. You'll get our famous club a baby seal guarantee after 30 days. If you wouldn't club a baby seal to stay on as a customer, you don't have to pay a penny. I wouldn't really recommend a guarantee that involves beating baby animals, but you get the point. All right. So step number seven, we are almost done. This is about naming your offer. What are you going to call everything, right? So luckily the man, Mr. Hormozy has that covered as well. It's called the magic headline formula. So you're going to remember the acronym magic when it comes to naming. Make a magnetic reason, announce the avatar, give them a goal, indicate a time interval, and complete with a container word. M is for magnetic reason why. And that's, we start the name with a word or a phrase that tells people why we are running our promotion. And there's a joke in the book about a time in college when Alex's fraternity had a party because a dude got his wisdom teeth removed. So the reason why can literally be anything, but it should answer one or both of the following questions. Why are they making this offer or why should I respond? What's in it for me? And you see this all the time, right? Like they'll say 80% off or it's a Black Friday half off sale or giveaway or spring, summer, back to school, grand opening, anniversary, Halloween, new year. Those are your reason why you are making the offer. And online coaches, which I've not always been good at this, but the more you can plan ahead, they take advantage of these calendar events like Black Friday and stuff to create reasons why they are offering a special. Moving on to A, it's where you announce your avatar. So it calls out your avatar. Who are you looking for? Who are you not looking for as a client? It will repel the person that does not fit the description. You want to be as specific as possible, like dentists, moms, brick and mortar business owners, online coaches, retired athletes, or busy executives. Or note you're using their demographic like we talked about in part one. Moving on to G is you give them a goal. So you articulate their dream outcome. It could be a single word or a phrase. It could be an event, feeling, experience, or an outcome. Anything that would excite them, but the more specific and tangible you can be, the better. What could the goal be? They want to become pain-free. They want to get first place. They don't want to be out of breath again. They want to find their perfect partner, create a grand slam offer, get their first client, 100K per year coaching business. I is indicating a time interval. You're letting people know the duration to expect. It gives you an example of how long your result will take to achieve. And by the way, quantifiable claims like income or weight loss are not usually allowed on a lot of the major platforms because it implies a guarantee, which goes against their rules. So don't give a quantifiable outcome with the duration unless your platform allows it. That being said, duration is a powerful component. You should use it anywhere where you don't need to deal with compliance. Examples, 90 minutes, 48 hours, 21 days, six weeks, or three months. Lastly, the letter C stands for complete with the container word. And that word denotes that the offer is a bundle of other things put together. It's a system. It's important because when they see the whole offer, they're going to realize that this is not a commodity. There's not an identical offer out there to what you have created. That is really important. That's something Russell Brunson stresses a lot when it comes to offer creation, is that you're creating something that's completely unique and there is nothing else for them to compare it to. These are a bunch of examples of what a container word would be. You've seen all these before. An intensive, a summit. My real estate program was called Freedom Accelerator, Masterclass, Liftoff, Reset, Workshop. So you have to pick the one that you like the best, but giving yourself a container word is very powerful. A couple of last pro tips before we wrap up. Rhyming. Good rhymes stick in people's minds so you can rhyme your program you can Google rhyming dictionary and make it easy. This isn't something you have to do, so don't try to force it, but do it if you can. Six, six pack, fast track, five day book, print, sprint, marriage, thrive, deep dive, et cetera. <laughs> Get some ass masterclass or alliteration, which is where you make all or most of the words start with the same letter or sound. An alternative approach to rhyming is to just use alliteration. This is actually easier for most people to come up with and again, it's not something you have to have, but it's cool if you do. Like the Make Money Masterclass, Big Booty Boot Camp, Real Estate Reset, Big Booty Boot Camp. Every word starts with a B. Make Money Masterclass. Every word starts with an M. And my daughter's name is Everly Elwood. And part of the reason I like it is because 
both letters start with E, her first name and her last name. So it flows nicely. And so that is why you choose alliteration. Now, here's some examples using that use the magic framework completely. Free, that's the magnetic. Mommy, that's the avatar. Goal, makeover, interval, 21 day. And then the container word is, I guess, makeover again. He does mention that you don't have to have all five, the M-A-G-I-C, but you just go for as many as you can, like five clients in five days blueprint. I think that one sounds pretty cool to me, but this is how you package your main offer. This is what not only your main offer will be called, but you can also use the magic framework to name your bonuses as well. You may have the five clients of five days blueprint as your main offer. And then you might have the 14 day find your perfect product launch as one of the bonuses. It wouldn't be fill your gym, but you get what I'm saying. And this framework is not just for naming like what your main offer is going to be, but for naming your bonuses and everything else. So in summary, we have created your solution delivery vehicles. We trimmed it and stacked it. We added scarcity, we added urgency, bonuses, guarantee, and we named everything using the magic framework. Just as a last reminder, if you're feeling overwhelmed, just remember you don't necessarily have to do each and every step in this training, at least not right away. You can do your best now and slowly add on to and improve your offer over time. And if you've done the entire process, congratulations, you now have an offer that is 10 times more likely to sell and since cash flow is the lifeblood of your business, the work you have done will pay dividends for years to come. Without having done this offer process, it, in my mind, doesn't make a lot of sense to do all the other pieces of growing your business because this is the end of the road. This is the finish line. This is where you either do or don't make money. And so having this in place is the foundation.